what does creativity mean to you? Does creativity always mean innovation? Whoa, <laughs> good first question. Yeah. I well, that's good. That's a very good question because um, I think that so my first answer for my kind of spontaneous answer would be no. It has you know because. But then at the same time, I'm thinking, well, it depends on what you mean with innovation and what you mean with creativity. I mean, what is it? What exactly does that mean? But I don't. So creativity to me is um, uh, to me, it actually means so, or at least I connect it strongly to imagination. Um, it's 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 not the same, but for me, it's I, I connect to imagination and imagination is the most significant thing that we are able to do as human beings to imagine things imagine things that are not real that are not there that don't exist yet uh and and that is such an amazing thing but we take it for granted so we can imagine things uh that um don't exist meaning that we are the only living beings as far as we can tell at least only living beings that can do so do so and we can imagine something that is not there but we can treat it as if it's real for instance uh, you know um a company <laughs> and this might sound really silly because we take it for granted like what do you mean? There's no such thing as companies. There is no such thing as a company. It's in our heads. It's, you know, maybe written it down and maybe, maybe we made a picture of a nice logo, but it's really in our mind that that is there. It's not really there. You can't see it. Yes, we have buildings, but that's not the company. So we can, we can, come, up, we can come up with a beautiful idea or a bad idea, actually, um, and we can organize ourselves accordingly as if it's real and it connects us, this, this story connects us. So to me, imagination, storytelling, uh, you know, creativity, these are kind of all really important things. Is it always innovation? Uh, depends on what you mean with innovation. I think uh, innovation uh, without imagination is impossible. So because innovation in sort of the way I would kind of now kind of frame it would be, something that doesn't exist yet. So you come up with something you don't know yet. So that it's making either connecting to existing things and creating new value out of it, or, you know, you, you know. so it's, again, uh, so going back a little bit to this, this idea of coming up with things that don't exist, I don't mean that we come up with things that are, you know, we kind of magically let appear. Usually it's making connections between existing things. So new value kind of, uh, is generated so that's innovation right innovation is coming up with new things yes. um, but you first have to imagine it so the, so so there's the there's an obvious connection there yeah uh, so you say there's a connection between creativity and innovation so far. well yeah so if you think about it that way and i'm thinking out loud as you can hear but uh, yes. if you think about innovation being something new and not non-existent mm -hmm. uh, and you have to kind of um, you know, you either stumble, you know, most innovations are, 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 you know, developed by accident. Most important innovations are things that are, you know, serendipitous or just like, you know, like there's, you know, all, all kinds of innovations are, are created because someone made a mistake and then recognized it as an opportunity uh, and then saw it as, hey, wait a minute, I did, I made a mistake what something happened that's interesting maybe we can use it for something else or it is uh it is using specific solutions or tools in a way that they were never intended for so it's unintended use so and then people recognize it like hey wait a minute we weren't that wasn't developed for that use oh so if innovation means coming up with something uh, that creates new value, new kind of new ways of doing things, uh, new creating new solutions for for people. Then uh, it has everything to do with um, imagination and creativity. To me, is all about uh, imagining things that are not there. Yeah, interesting. So you also mentioned uh, you already mentioned companies. And that's my second question. How essential is a company's creativity or its employees' creativity regarding to its long-term success? Well, so, uh, you know, uh, I can talk about that for a long time, uh, but 
basically, I can give you two two kind of answers or two sides of a, of the story. One is, I don't know of any company myself that didn't start with a creative solution uh, that didn't start with something innovative or something new, something that you know, was invented by some founder. So in the roots of most, if not all companies are based in creativity, in creative problem solving, in coming up with something or a combination of things that uh, were developed and thought up by founders and entrepreneurs who are, you know, so it's always been part of that. It's just that when they, they grew, they kind of uh, needed to find a balance between business and innovation, the creativity and and sort of the, the, the business side of it and the organizational side of it. So they needed to have HR and marketing and sales and, and you know, and et cetera, et cetera, production. Um, and often now the balance between the two is gone. So um, I often share this story of uh, I was working for a, 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 quite a big German company where they called their innovation labs their submarines. And uh, because they had needed to be kind of hidden uh, because a, a typical innovation uh, department or lab does things uh, uh, and learn things by trial and error. Now in the business side of the company, making mistakes was not a positive thing at all. But in the innovation in the labs, making mistakes is part of learning. So it's a, it's, that's how you learn things. So we forget that um, creativity is actually at the core of all successful companies. Um, and we and I'm not saying that that um, uh, it's 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 uh, it's wrong that there is this whole business side to it. No, it's just that the balance often is kind of lost, and we forget where we came from. So yes, of course. So it, is creativity important for for long term success of companies? Did they exist without? Can they exist without? Can you imagine a company without any creativity at all? It. I mean. For long term, I don't. I don't think anybody would kind of see that as a long term, uh, su successful long term strategy of kind of killing all creativity. It's actually, um, you know, but creativity should be in balance with, you know, things that need. To, sometimes things just need to work, right? You need to also have st stability, uh, and it's the balance. It's and it's always a wave. It's always like you go from from structure to, to chaos and from structure to chaos. So I think that as if it's only one or the other, it's, it's both. So creativity, I think that's, that's uh, yes, of course, it's, it's key to uh, companies and organizations. At the other end, creativity for long-term success, if I sort of, again, connect that to imagination, a vision, a mission, a purpose is always about imagining a future, a po potential future. Scenario planning is all about imagining potential futures. So that, that's creativity, that's imagination, that's creativity. We don't know that. So we always have something on the horizon, horizon that we can't really prove. I mean, we might pretend, you know, to prove stuff, and but we don't really know. So, so it's so I think imagination is always part of companies and organizations. It's just that we want to label creativity and put it in a box and say, this is creativity or this is design, this is innovation. If you just imagine wherever you are now, you know, close your eyes and now imagine it. Everything that has been designed by human beings, everything, everything that has been designed, in bad or, or good, doesn't matter, but it has been designed by a human being is gone. Imagine it all gone. Think about what's in your room, what's around you, the house, your clothes, your your the desk, your your computer. Everything is designed by people. Design is everywhere. It's just that uh, you know we kind of try to label things and put things into boxes. When you think about creativity and when we talk about creativity, you also talked about design. I say design thinking and. What role does design thinking play when it comes to creativity? And can one be creative without following the rules of the design thinking process? <laughs> That's an interesting paradoxical thing you, you said. Yes. <laughs> can you be creative without following the rules of the... 
I think uh, creativity is all about breaking the rules, right? Um, it's changing the rules, it's playing with the rules, it's knowing the rules and then and then and organizing them differently. Design thinking is not so. I started uh, my company, Design Thinkers, uh, uh, over 15 years ago with a very strong um, feeling that um, we needed to get out of this idea that everything needs to kind of be. Uh, in a structure. Everything needs to be in a box and labeled. It is actually more about um, a, um, a, a different way of thinking about things, which is really difficult to explain. So what do we do? So we, we try to explain this to people. We say, well, so we've been, you know, we've been taught in a certain structured way in our schools and in our businesses. Um, we now say, actually, uh, that's a problem. That's a problem because you always get the same outcome. Well, actually what you wanna do is reinvent the process and whatever steps or rules you have. Every time we have to think about what is it, what is it we're trying to do and then design a process or, or a methodology to fit with that. So what we're trying to achieve. But we are not used to it. We're used to saying, you know, we use we. I call this Prince Two thinking. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's basically a methodology. You just tick the boxes. You just it says, well, there's these kind of steps, and these are all the things you need to do. And if you tick all the boxes, there you go. Here's an outcome, and you have no responsibility of for the process or, or the tools or the methodology because you're just following it, and you just got your black belt or yellow belt or whatever in the methodology, and that's what you follow, and you have no responsibility over the methodology in design thinking at least in my in the effort in my my battle i always said no it's the other way around what are you trying to achieve and then i don't care what it's called you know use six sigma tools and lean and 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 agile and, and who cares it's about what are you trying to achieve and what are the tools that you need to create that new solution so design thinking is kind of now uh, you know, it's the same with, it's always the same. All of a sudden it's like, no, it's six steps and you follow the six steps and, you know, and then people will kind of be very disappointed because they follow the whatever four steps, six steps, whatever steps, you know, um, uh, they hide behind taking responsibility. And I always said, it is about thinking differently. It is not about the tools. It is not about steps. It is about doing things, thinking differently about doing things and uh, taking responsibility and saying, okay, so what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do here? And oh, by the way, maybe it's good to work with a diverse group of people instead of working with all like-minded people. Maybe it's better to kind of do some real research. Maybe if I want to get to know my customers, should I maybe go out and talk to customers? Hmm, this might be a good idea. I mean, a lot of stuff that you know we teach in design thinking uh, is common sense. It's like, you know your company is broken, fix it. What is really going on? You know, so it's about reflecting and making things real and, 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 and simply saying, you know, all the tools and all the methodology we use in design thinking and services on UX, it is about making things explicit. This is what your customer actually thinks. Deal with it, you know, um, but the problem is culture and is systems. So the problem is that, that we are stuck in systems that are more powerful than we are as individuals. And uh, changing the system is uh, what we're trying to do. And it takes time and it take, it's a most slow process. And design thinking is one of those now buzzwords that are out there to kind of address the problem of the systemic issue. Design thinking to me was just a way of kind of staying close to whatever was changing. It is just, it's an attempt to create a language so I can talk as a designer, I can talk to a marketeer, as a marketeer, I can talk to an IT person. I can, we can talk about, you know, other things like empathy and we can, we can use a, a language for change. And I think that is the attempt of design thinking as it is an attempt by UX and Agile and all the other buzzwords out there, which are all the same. It's all the same. It's, it, there is no difference. And that's a very long answer. <laughs> because I am there, I'm always very kind of like, it's not a step-by-step -step process and it's not a workshop. It's not easy to sell a mindset, but it's easy to sell a workshop and it's easy to sell a fixed process because it makes us feel comfortable and safe, but it's a lie. So there.
Yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to have the right mindset to be maybe in this processes and to be creative. So my next question is a little bit into the topic you talked about. Is creativity an inherent talent or can one learn how to be creative? And when you can learn it, how does it work to learn how to be creative? There's a lot of research about creativity um, in, within children. You know, if you go to a school and you ask a bunch of, uh, what, five, six-year-olds, Uh, my son of uh, uh, eight year old uh, paints an elephant. Uh, he paints something that might not resemble an elephant in my mind, but it's an elephant to him. And he says, look, it's an elephant and it's awesome. And it's an elephant. My daughter, she's 14. She says, I can't paint an elephant. Right. So we get taught out of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that we're taught out of creativity. Um, each year you become a little less confident in your own creativity because you're being shown that there's a right way of doing things and there's a wrong way of doing things and you're going to be judged every time. I think we're creative all the time, by the way, even if you, if you think you're not. I mean, how do you go through a life without solving problems every day, right? So you know, we're creative as human beings. So uh, we always are. It's just that we label creativity in a certain way. That uh, Creativity is about drawing or creativity is about, you know, designing. Why? That's not true. Creativity is everywhere. It's in our lives. It's, it's how we live. Yes, of course, we are all creative. The only problem is that we are made insecure um, because it's labeled in a certain way. You know, it, it is also about training your brain and creating different kind of pathways, uh, you know, and neural pathways in your brain. It's also just training. Um, also, there's talent, which is not the same as having a skill. Uh, so, you know, we are all different and we all go th through life and, and learn different things. And we all kind of grow up differently and we come from a different family. And, you know, I come from a family of, of both uh, my mother's side is more artists and my, my father's side more scientists. Uh, so I have both of these kind of, uh, you know, worlds in my head, both of the, these voices. So, but they influence me. So I, I, so for me, it wasn't weird to kind of think of myself as uh, potentially an artist because, you know, I come from a family like that. So, so that's, so, so for me, it's also the options that you're given and the examples that you get. It's the way you see yourself. So, and the other thing is that um, um, for me, I, I, so I have dyslexia and dyslexia has been, um, I know we say, and Einstein too, you know that? Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, you know, and, but anyway, the, 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 the whole idea of, of, of why, for instance, something like dyslexia is important in, in, in creativity uh, is that, uh, um, if you have dyslexia or something like that, you're offered systems that you just don't fit in. So I'm a school dropout. I never finished any school because I just couldn't fit into that system. I just couldn't. Uh, it made me very insecure. So it also made me create sort of these defense mechanisms in my character, which are sometimes difficult to deal with for other people. But it's because of sort of dyslexia that I never fitted into these systems. But it also means that I recognize other things. I see other patterns and other people do because I'm kind of outside of the system. And uh, I, was, I, I was reading this article the other day. It actually makes, so they said uh, people with dyslexia Uh, are are the best spies. I'm like, wow, really? That's really, I should have known that when I was a kid, I could become a spy. But basically because they see things differently, they see different patterns. So it's also that um, it's almost, and uh, uh, almost for me, it's like, if you have dyslexia, and actually my daughter has also dyslexia, turns out, which I'm not like, yay, or something. But anyway, the idea of, if you want to be creative, Uh, you, you know, and you're, you don't have dyslexia or something like that, that kind of makes you kind of not fit into the system, you have a problem. <laughs> so, because if you fit into the system really well, you're going to be programmed that way. And I, my whole system rejected that system. So I was never programmed. Again, a long answer, sorry. It's, it's a topic close to my heart. It's really interesting to know how you go with this um, topic and what do you think about it and how it's in your family. It's really interesting to know the backgrounds, why you are there, where you are now. <laughs> so Robert told me that you are currently writing a book about creative leadership, to which Robert also will contribute some content. 
Um, could you please give me a brief summary about what creative leadership is? Yes. Creative leadership to me is uh, the ability to create a environment for people to be creative, to allow them to be entrepreneurial, creative, uh, to explore, to experiment. It is a, uh, an ability to be vulnerable so other people can be vulnerable. So it's a leadership. It's not management. It's leadership being sort of uh, the example. Uh, but it's all about how do I create a change or how do I create movement within myself? How do I connect to myself? So in order I, to connect to other people and to create movement within others. So it's a very difficult uh, path for a lot of people because it, become, it, because it starts within yourself. True creative leadership, true leadership in general, starts within yourself. It's about empathy, right? So empathy doesn't, so we always say empathy, it's about understanding other people and it's walking in their shoes, looking through their eyes and seeing their reality, which is, yes, of course, that you could, you could kind of uh, see empathy that way, but it starts within yourself. Uh, because I don't think that you can actually look at the world through other people's eyes. You can't really walk in the shoes of someone else. It's impossible because you always take your own biases with you, your own, your own perception, your own, you know, the way you grew up, your own context. You take that with you always. So you interpret whatever you think someone else sees in your own way. So empathy is more about recognizing that you cannot. So you have to connect to other people. You have to kind of involve other people by asking them and listening to, listening to other people about what they feel instead of trying to kind of be them because you can't. You are yourself. But it starts with understanding who are you? Where are you from? So and if you want to create a safe space for people to be creative and to be vulnerable, you have to be that yourself. And that's sort of the core of creative leadership. The other thing is it is also about being a navigator creative leadership. It's about the unknown and allowing the unknown and allow, allowing the not knowing and allowing the fact that what we know might be wrong uh, and, and there's stuff out there that we don't even know about. So it's again, it's about back to this insecurity and taking the people with you on this journey. Again, a long answer. Yes, you already answered my next question because you already told me really how important is creative leadership for this complex and rapidly changing world we live in right now, because it's always change. It's always something new. Exactly. Well, you said something important. It's complexity. You already talked about systems and systemic problems. That's the complexity of it, right? It's always systemic. It's never a one-on-one a, a -on -one thing. It's always a systemic issue that we're dealing with whatever small project you do if you think about it you know long enough it's always part of a system we're always part of a system everything is part of it and whatever you do you affect the system but sometimes we just don't want to know what how it affects the wider system we just want to know how it affects like you know the, the thing we do and we solve a problem for some sort of someone or some group and that's what we look at but how it affects the wider system we don't and how do you change that system And I think that is the biggest question of our of our life time. I think, how do we change systems? Because the system is broken. New economics, for instance, is one of the things that I'm, I'm also very passionate about. And I know Robert is because he's an econ economist uh, by training. And, and so new, new economics, I think that's this is sort of part of you know, my interest in also his philosophy and thinking and other people who are in, in economics around Uh, leadership because it's actually th that system that needs to change. It's not an unchangeable thing. It, it is something. So, you know, Kate Rayworth's uh, donut economy, uh, you know, I, I, that makes me hopeful thinking about because that is about understanding the impact you have long term and also in the system. Change starts with one person always always a change starts with one person. And and I think uh, I think that if we make the right choices as just as an individual, it will kind of, in the end, create the change that we want to see. And you also talked about systems. And I like to know, what do you think is, I would say, wrong with the existing types of leadership? Well, I'm not really sure what's wrong or right. I think there's a time 
for everything and there's 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 stages and we we you know you need yeah yeah i I don't want to be too political about this i mean i think it's it's wrong if you think that uh, a, a company is about generating a maximum profit. I think there's something wrong about that. If it's just about you making and collecting as much money as possible, I think then it's wrong. It's wrong because um, just because you um, are able to collect all that money, how come you have all that power? Why is that? Why is the relationship between collecting a lot of money and then having a lot of power there? That, that there, there's something very weird and, and and wrong about that. How come? That if you um, do not fit in and you couldn't make it and you and you and, and so you don't fit into the system, you, uh, I don't understand. I, do, I don't understand how you can be so rich and still wanting to be more rich, and how you how you can lead a company that um, you know. This is the problem with social media companies, where right? the tech companies at the moment, like you can be Facebook and caused the death of people because of your organization how come you don't stop why don't you just say i don't want this cancel the whole thing you know pull the plug we we can do without it right and seriously i don't understand how you can continue doing that and defending that so i think the 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 system is uh making um you know, creating these poisonous kind of environments where it's all about maximizing profit and uh, and whatever the cost, whether it's the environment, whether it's people. I mean, but the large majority of the people working in corporate environments and, and, and uh, large organizations are unhappy in their job, <laughs> you know, so yeah, you know, if that's your company, if you're managing a company like that, um, is that your responsibility? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that's also also your responsibility. If you're not, and you can't change it because it's too complex. Sure, maybe true. Are you trying? No, then yeah, then you may be not so good. Uh, are you trying and failing? All right, I get that. I understand. It's not easy because it's a systemic problem. So. What's wrong with uh, managers? I think it's uh, it is because we've been taught that uh, capitalism is all about collecting as much money as possible, and growth is unlimited. You know, so I know that growth, this idea of investing in the future uh, that doesn't exist, sparked uh, you know the the whole uh, economic growth idea, and that you can grow uh, because you trust the future, and because you can grow, so you can give credit. You can borrow money as a bank or an, or, or an investor in, uh, to people who have an idea that isn't there yet, but you trust if business is not for people, you know, what is it for really? Seriously, what it really is it for? So um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I, I get the benefits of capitalism, but I also think that we have to take care of each other. And uh, we live on a planet uh, where there's a whole bunch of people uh, probably way too much, way too many people, probably. But, you know, we have to take care of each other and we, we can. So I think you're a bad manager, business leader. If that's not something you kind of worried about, if that if that doesn't keep you up at night, or at least if you're not trying to be part of that kind of struggle and uh, if you just don't care and it's only about making money, but again, it's, it's a slow process. It's going to, cause systemic change is, takes time and it's happening. It's not like it's not happening. It is happening. Whether we want it or not, it's not like we have to say, all right, let's go change. No, it, it is changing. It is changing. It is just that it's, it's slow. And sometimes we don't see it. Uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it is, it is changing. Yeah, you talked about changing, taking care of each other, helping each other. And so my next question is, which steps can a company or an executive, an employee take regarding creative leadership? Well, I think uh, um, if you look at most organizations uh, at the moment, they are either thinking about becoming more agile uh, because they have to, because they see it as as a problem, because they see that if they're not, they're not going to survive. 
um, or they are already kind of organized agile, uh, whether they are really agile or not, that's, that's a, we can talk about that. But um, there is a, a growing understanding that you need to be agile as an organization, which means you have to organize differently, which means that like, you know, there's lots of, you know, working with companies that are now organized in kind of what they call a matrix structure with tribes and, and squads and chapters, right? So it's um, in, an, in an agile way, which also means that when you're in a tribe, you are kind of very, uh, you, can, you can work quite independently uh, from management. So, because, I mean, it's it basically creative leadership and leadership, it's about letting go. It's about giving leadership to also people who are not maybe not in the hierarchy, uh, you know, uh, very high up, but it's about letting go and, and creating an environment for people to take responsibility and ownership. Now, the pandemic has helped, is helping, because the pandemic means that a lot of people work from home, which means that everyone who's kind of a micromanager, you know, is like, how do I do this? You cannot micromanage people when they're not in your office. You, you know, so that we become, so I think a lot of companies are more and more realizing they have to change. So they are changing and they are doing it. It's just that sometimes we don't see it because it takes such a long time. Um, it is again, uh, like I said earlier, create the space for people to take ownership to create the space for people to be themselves, to be vulnerable, to try new things, to explore, to learn, to grow. Uh, and uh, that's because uh, an, another problem uh, nowadays is how do you get talent in your company and keep them in your company? When you offer them what? A place where, where every day is a marathon, uh, all the, the work they do that whatever generates profit is, you know, all the profit is sucked up to the top. Um, you know, uh, they're un everyone's unhappy. Uh, they're stressed. There's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a fear of, uh, of failure, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why will, why would they, and then what did they work for, for maximizing profit for what, you know? Um, so they rather work, if you're talented, you rather work for a company that has a purpose that you think, Hey, they're doing something awesome for the planet or for people, or you work for a startup because it's way more exciting and, and interesting and, and dynamic. So how do you, as a corporate big organization, how do you keep those talents in? You have to stop me if, if you want to, because <laughs> I go like- I already answered my next question. All right. All right. I think I can yes. read your mind. <laughs> no. yeah, you do, exactly, you do. Because <laughs> there was the question about work environment and, how does a work environment look like that encourages creativity? I think you already told me so much things about it, but may, can you maybe give me some aspects which are really important to encourage the creativity in the work environment? Yeah, trust. It's trust. Trust your people. Trust. It's, a sim it's simple. And it's the most difficult thing to give because giving people trust means that you have to really then let them also make mistakes. But if you really, really, really give people your trust, um, they will work for you and they will trust you. And if they trust you, you will have real conversations. You will know what's going on. They will share things with you that otherwise they won't because they don't trust you. Um, and you can share things with them and you can, you know, you can create an environment where people are authentic and they will put in positive energy and they will work, you know, sounds maybe it's a bit cynical, but they will work harder. If you give people trust seriously and let them go, you know, you'll know two things. One is um, they can take it and you will also attract the people who can you will kind of create an environment for those kind of people that actually can work in that environment. So, so I think that, um, I think that is key. So trust is key and, and, and without trust, not, it's impossible. Yes. I think you, you need to have the right mindset also for being creative to become create a creative leader. And I have one last question. This is, um, what role does corporate culture play in the context of creative leadership and creativity? 
Um, so culture is, is, is an interesting topic because culture, what is culture really? It, it, culture is, um, is created, it's behavior, right? So it's created uh, by behavior. People behave in a certain way towards each other and they, uh, they respond in a certain way towards uh, what's happening. Um, so it's behavior. So if you want to change behavior, how do you, how do you change behavior? If you measure people or give them incentives and so give them to so reward them for a certain kind of behavior and punish them for something else, uh, that's the behavior you're going to get. You're going to get the behavior that, you know, is rewarded, right? So if you want to change your corporate culture, so people are uh, more less afraid to make mistakes, you have to think about how to celebrate mistakes or at least not punish it and make it clear that it's a, it is something that is, that it's a, it's, it's a good thing. So a lot, I know a lot of companies that talk about entrepreneurial uh, spirit, uh, creating these entrepreneurs, uh, ha wanting them, people to be more creative and innovative, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they uh, have a culture of fear uh, for making mistakes. So corporate culture is, again, and we go back to trust. It's the same thing. It's what, what, it's what I was talking about. It is about having trust in people to take responsibility and ownership and they can take it. And if, 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 if you don't, um, you know, you're going to have to stay a micromanager and keep an eye on everything they do all the time. Um, and, and, you know, and hire people who, who, are, are, who are able to take that responsibility uh, because you know, not everybody is comfortable with it because we're not all taught that. So you don't want to kind of confuse people, but it's, it is, um, you know, create those teams and, and put them in an environment that allows them to, uh, you know, be themselves. Again, um, we also, the other thing is, um, it's about diversity. So diversity is such an important thing. So I, ju I just briefly mentioned uh, the old boys network. Um, but I think one of the big issues that we need to kind of uh, tackle and solve is uh, where are all the female leaders? Um, you know, where's the diversity in leadership and, and, you know, not just, not just male, female, but also people of color, et cetera, et cetera people from ba different backgrounds, uh, diversity of thought, uh, diversity, um, that is something that needs to be solved because if diversity, you know, is the key, oh, another really important key to change, to creating an environment of trust and inclusiveness. If you do something, if you work on something, you want to have the success of your work. You know, you want to experience the success of your work as fast as possible. Sure, that's short-term thinking. It is not satisfying for us to think about working on something that will not benefit you, but it might benefit the next generation or even the generation after. That just doesn't give us any pleasure because I want my pleasure now. I want my bonus now. I want my money now. I want my Jaguar now. I want my whatever. Now in my lifetime, I want to. I want to have. So it, it doesn't satisfy us to think about doing something really good for the next generation. Where you so, so it's a. It's. I think this is also something that we need to kind of change. This idea of when, what is happiness, and how do you become happy, and how is success related to that, and what is success? I think that if you have a company, and and for instance. Um, this has been shown over and over again, like family businesses, like a lot of the German companies are, you know, are family owned businesses. They do actually have a long term, long term uh, vision and, and because they do think long term because they do think about next generations. So I would say, I hope that all companies become family companies, maybe not like real family, but I think become family at heart, become family companies saying, the people that work for us are family and we take not only care of them, but we also take care of the communities they come from and not just now, but also towards the future. I think that is something that we have to do with long-term thinking versus short-term thinking. Yes, I think it's always the purpose that you know why you're doing work and for what you are doing your work. Yes. And 
know, can you change with your work something yeah. in your life or for others or maybe also just for yourself and about what you think about it and how maybe you can change also the mindset of, of other people. I think this is really important. You made it clear that you need to have the right mindset to be creative, to be a creative leader, to encourage your people or the environment to be creative and to do things and to make innovations. It's, I think, a really long process. Yeah, and it starts with uh, honesty and it starts with trust and courage. Um, Uh, you know, to change yourself and to, uh, and then, um, because that's where it starts. And then, and then, then change your relationship to others and your role within the system. And I think that is the, um, the, the, the difficult part, but also the most satisfying part, because if you actually are able to have that courage and have that trust and, uh, and, 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 and take that step, um, it, it, it is uh, highly satisfying because it's about real things and it's not just about superficial, you know, it's going about your day. It is, you know, you, at least that's my feeling. I, I want to be connected to something that is meaningful. And I think we all do in the end, we want to do things that are meaningful. And I think uh, meaningful means, and it doesn't mean that you launch a successful product or service. I mean, sure. It can be meaningful if that saves people's lives or whatever. Sure. But to me, meaningful means the connection to people, having meaningful connections to others and, and supporting each other and, uh, and uh, helping other people uh, with what you know or supporting them or having a, a meaningful connection. I think we are human beings and uh, we are, you know, we are, um, we're always looking for connection and community. And I think, uh, I think that that's the key. I think that's, that's what makes it meaningful. So, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much no, thank for you. all these information and your time and those interesting aspects about creativity and creative leadership so do you like to add something regarding creativity in companies or creative leadership did we miss any important aspect about it uh, no. oh, that's a really good question I don't know. I have to re-listen the, uh, the the podcast. <laughs> oh, wait, I should have said that. I, I no. I think we talked about everything that that was important. I think we uh, we touched all the the topics that were important to me. I think it's. Uh, I think the one. If you, so, uh, you know, the only thing that maybe uh, I would like to reiterate or readdress is is this idea of uh, design thinking or services or whatever being a fixed process. Uh, I really hope that uh, that we we can keep the momentum and we might want to call it different. We might want to go back to systems thinking or maybe even design management, I don't care. Uh, but we can keep that community and that momentum and that, that spirit of life of uh, thinking differently and um, and having this, uh, this because there's an amazing community of people out there that want to do things differently and don't get stuck into a box with a label. Because once we have definitions and uh, fixed processes for something, it means it's dead. And, uh, and I really hope that we can keep that spirit alive of exploring 